dasar. <laughs> Nanti suruh boyoan yang keluar. <laughs> iya, itu yang repot. <laughs> sehat, Prof? Iya. Sehat-sehat? Syukur ya. ya, ya. Alhamdulillah. Iya. Dengar kabar lockdown lagi dari Fajar. Iya. Nah, kami juga oh. sedang sangat ini tinggi kasusnya di sini. Australia tidak terlalu baik. Anu, anunya sekarang anu, in, infection rate. Indonesia? Tidak tahu ini akan lockdown apa enggak. Kayaknya kami lebih bandel gitu di sini. Disuruh lockdown juga tidak terjadi mungkin. Itu sulit ya kalau lockdown. Sulit. Ekonominya jatuh. Iya, yeah, that's that's a problem. Uh, apa? Too many people will complain. Yeah, yeah, betul. Because they cannot, uh, they cannot simply live because they have to to go outside to yeah. to earn their their, their living. Mungkin pakai masker seperti Thailand, baik sekali katanya. Thailand yeah, seperti apa? Thailand baik. Masker, gitu. Maskernya, Masker. saya waktu Thailand tahun yang lalu bulan Februari itu sudah pakai masker, masker gitu. Kita masker, ya ada sih himbauan, cuman <laughs> ya gitulah. Iya di sini oh, juga okay. gitu orang, ba- apalagi ba- yang muda. Yang muda bahasa bahasa orang, bukannya dari Thailand juga ya? Apa? Bulan Februari saya ke Thailand, tapi kan ya. belum terlalu. Waktu itu Februari, belum terlalu ya? itu. Februari yang lalu. Saya balik ke Austria atau minggu yang terakhir di Februari. Balik ke Austria tanggal 29 ya. Februari. Terus 10 hari lagi lockdown di Austria. <laughs> Ka- hmm. Kami kembali waktu itu hmm. tanggal 15 Februari. Insya Allah. Sekitar tanggal 15 Februari lah. Kemudian ITB mulai lockdown itu tanggal 20 sekian Maret ya. Jadi Maret. memang waktu itu ITB, eh, ITB. Indonesia Maret, belum ya. ada kasus sama sekali waktu saya pulang, tapi sudah mulai ketar-ketir lah, sampai saya termasuk yang kena wording sebetulnya waktu itu. Sama Bu Putri langsung suluh periksa, <laughs> karena sempat sakit. Terus, ya udah tapi kemudian terus ada kasus yang depok gitu. Sudah dari situ terjun bebas kayaknya. Iya. <coughs> Tapi, tapi tahun depan tahun depan kayaknya udah mulai ini ya ada ada berapa aktivitas yang udah diperbolehkan di kampus ya, tergantung situasi di sekarang anu tuh anu vaksinasinya tuh akan ya. mulai katanya tahun depan ya di, di Inggris sudah mulai kalau di ya, Inggris sudah sudah boleh ya. Inggris sudah mulai ada itu. Itu vaksin yang vaksin, dari vaksinnya ini. sudah yang Pfizer sudah ya. diizinkan gitu ya. Nanti nanti ya, mulainya ya. katanya dua minggu yang ya. dua minggu lagi. Mungkin buat medical sih apa dokter perawat gitu ya, ya. didahulukan. Jadi yang eh, apa namanya yang berasa juga anak-anak ya. Kemarin saya telepon keponakan saya, dia sudah mengeluh, dia bikin lagu. Saya bosan sekolah online. <laughs> Aduh, kasihan mereka yang tidak bisa keluar. Orang tuanya juga pusing. Iya, itu yang sulitnya. Sangat-sangat, ya bosan gitu, di rumah terus, itu ternyata juga pengen ketemu temannya iya. gitu. Pengen main keluar, anak tujuh tahun. Ya kan iya, sangat iya. sangat sedang ingin bergerak gitu. Oh, mau bergerak, ya. Bahkan keluar rumah pun tidak boleh hanya main di sekitar rumah itu kan juga. Anaknya Pak Wikan juga kan mungkin hmm. terbaik. Umur berapa? Ya di rumah aja. <laughs> umur berapa di kan anaknya? Anak umur 9. 9. Apa? Ya, Januari Nen. nanti ini 10. Ya yang satu hampir 10. 15, 15 ya. Hampir iya. 10 satu 15. Yang Dua tahun lagi langsung. udah udah kuliah SMA <laughs> selesai. Tahu tahu sudah kuliah. Yang juga. satu SMA, yang satu SD. Iya, <laughs> dua tahun lagi udah kuliah. <laughs> tahu tahu. ITB. Tahu udah mau kuliah. ITB nggak atau malah keluar? <laughs> Cinta. <laughs> mungkin ITB mungkin kita lihat saja. Lihat saja nanti. 
Ini mainnya main ini nih. Bikan, anu, zat, zat, nanti kalau saya Roblox. kuliah ini yang <laughs> sama yang ini, hadir, saudaranya. yang hadir nih orang mainnya orang, juga orang, online jadinya. Bikan, mas Bikan mas ya, ya, yang yang hadir tuh orang orang informatika apa orang lain yang yang, yang hari ini, Prof. Ya, ya. Uh, ini mahasiswa kebanyakan, Prof. Dari okay. dua mata kuliah yang wajib. Ya, ya. Uh, ya. Manajemen, database management dan uh, advanced data modeling yang diwajibkan okay. hadir. Karena itu saya, ya. anu, ya. mahasiswa mahasiswanya Ufazat. Ya. Mahasiswa saya. <laughs> uh, tapi di, uh, kita buka juga open, uh, ya. apa namanya? Apakah kemudian ada yang lain yang hadir juga? Tapi sejauh ini kelihatannya sih masih mahasiswa semua ini. Oh ya. Yeah. Yang muncul. So mostly students, Prof. Jadi uh, yeah, yeah. seperti ke students saja kelihatannya. Yeah. So student informatika semua. Yeah. Informatics, uh, system and technology, eh system and apa? STI itu? System, eh STI itu apa? <laughs> Information Technology, Informatics Inform System, System and Technology. Hal nomor prodinya apa sih lupa. Information Technology. Ya, yeah, Informatics Central. <laughs> ya sama aja. Sama, sama aja, Bro. Mahasiswa <laughs> third and fourth year mostly. Tahun okay. keempat dan tahun ketiga. Oke. Okay. Baik, ini yang hadir sudah 60 orang dari ekspektasi kita harusnya sekitar 100 lebih ya. Ada juga yang di YouTube ada. Oh YouTube, eh, ya, ya. link YouTube-nya apa? Ya, juga mungkin perlu memantau. Uh, ini yang stay itu. Bisa di share di chat nggak mas? Saya okay. harus nyari dulu. Uh, stay, eh, ada di komen. Okay. Oh itu udah ada, ada. Ini ada 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 di ada di chat ada. Trisha yang banyak men share. Udah udah. Sudah sudah. sudah. Baik ini sudah pukul 15.01. Kita mulai saja mungkin yang hadir sudah 84 orang. Shall we start, Prof? Bisa, ya. ya. Ah, baik, terima kasih banyak. So, uh, good afternoon everyone, especially students from uh, database management class and advanced data modeling class. Uh, we are here today for a session, uh, very honored. We welcome Professor Amin Choa from TU Vienna. Uh, we, we met uh, already a long time ago, 2014, I think, the first ICO DSE. Uh, so, Professor uh, Amin Choa, uh, maybe some of you who already present uh, several minutes ago heard us talking in Bahasa Indonesia because actually Professor Amin Choa born in Surabaya, right, Professor? <laughs> Yeah, betul. So, so actually, if you want to ask something, you can also ask in Bahasa Indonesia yeah. <laughs> later on. But professor will 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 present in uh, English. Okay. okay. So uh, the title of uh, this uh, course, how <laughs> do it? A lecture. Okay. Is uh, concepts, use, and perspective of advanced data modeling approaches. So it's a uh, really about data modeling. So hopefully uh, you students can learn something about issues, further issues or more advanced issues on data modeling other than 
other than things that you can learn in uh, during uh, our uh, our classes. So uh, without further ado, I think I will uh, present the time for Professor Amin Chowa to to give your lecture. And uh, sorry, uh, we have some feedback. Okay, so Professor. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, I will give you the time to present. And uh, I, I don't know how many yeah. minutes do you need for for the presentation. It depends. I will see if if there are questions or not. I have I have a lot of, of uh, slides <laughs> uh, de yeah. depending yeah. on on the that why I was asking uh, what is the background of the students. Yeah? So I can't okay. Take, yeah. I think uh, we can do it uh, right like this. Uh, uh, professor will present, but if you have some questions, yeah. you can also write, type it down uh, on the chat. On the if chat you are in, uh, in 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 uh, in Zoom, if you are in uh, you're connecting via YouTube, you can also type it on the uh, on the uh, how, how do you call it in YouTube? Uh, also chat yeah, chat forum you, over there. Yeah. We will try to. We will, uh, I will try and uh, also the other, I, I think uh, some other lecturers uh, uh, monitor this. Uh, we will try to uh, present your questions uh, to professor. Uh, we have a lot of time actually until around uh, four, uh, in Indonesia it's 16.40, yeah. four, four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So okay, uh, we have a lot of time. So feel free to ask via chat, or if you like to ask uh, directly, you can also do it. Just raise your hand, and uh, we will we will see. Uh, uh, I think we can just uh, uh, see whether uh, if, if you uh, whether we can uh, give you the time to ask your question personally. So uh, I think that will be. Uh, uh, so I will give the time to Professor Joa, uh, which uh, please present your, uh, your presentation. Thank you. Terima kasih, Ibu, untuk Anu memberikan kesempatan berbicara di ITB ini. But I will continue in, in English. Uh, the topic chosen by me was concepts, use, and perspectives of advanced data modeling, especially uh, I will focus on the semantic web link open data uh, and knowledge graphs and its applications and where we uh, will go in the future. So how are the perspectives? So uh, before starting uh, today's agenda is like this. I, I will start with a few words on Asia Uninet and then I will give the uh, first part some motivation about link enterprise data networks. In the second part, the evolution of linked data in semantic web. Uh, in one sentence, from web of documents to knowledge graphs. And then uh, a very short part about knowledge graph examples and definitions. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, a very interesting book was uh, written, was published by Edward Curry. Uh, with a vision on real-time linked data spaces. And if there are enough time, I want to give you some perspectives about this new book, which is an open book. So everybody, uh, it is on the Creative Co Commons, so everybody can download it. And I think it is worthwhile to read it, especially for students. It is written in a very uh, concise form. And then I... And last part, I want to give some conclusions. I have to remark that the part two and three are based from lecture slides uh, where uh, uh, from our institute, especially Mata Sabu, and perhaps many of you know him, even Fajar Ekaputra uh, from ITB, who is now uh, since many, many years in Austria and also all the uh, people from the semantic systems group. And the part four on the perspective is accepted from Edward Curry's recent book, which is just published 
in this November. So once again, special thanks to Marta Sabu and Fajr Ikaputra. But before starting, I want to uh, give you some insights why we are so closely connected, ETB and Vienna University of Technology, uh, uh, TU Wien, Vienna University of Technology. That, the reason is that our relationship started already in 94, when Asia Uninet was founded. It is the Austrian Southeast Asian University Partnership Network. And in 1999, when we joined the European Union, it is even broadened to uh, ASEAN European Academic University Network. And ETB was a very active member and still a very active member of Asia Uninet. Even once the president of Asia Uninet was the rector former rector of ITB, uh, Kusma Yanto Kadiman, and uh, we have still very, very close relationships between ITB and the Austrian universities. Uh, in Austria, all universities uh, are state universities, are member of ASEA Uninet, as you can see, the 21 of them. And at present, we have a large number of uh, quality universities as members of Asia Uninet. And uh, from Southeast Asia, we have Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Myanmar, and Vietnam. And also Pakistan, which is not an ASEAN country, but uh, is very closely uh, connected with Asia Uninet as an uh, associate member. And until now, Austria had. Uh, 400 PhDs from Pakistan finished, so alumni. So this is the largest country. And per capita, we did the most uh, educational work, higher educational work uh, for Pakistan, more than the US, more than UK and others. And what is the aim of Astra Uninet? Just short, it is uh, predominantly on the research cooperation amongst its member universities. So especially we want to deepen the academic relations. Uh, and what is very nice, we have excellent long lasting relationships between the universities and also between the staff since this 25 years. And it is a role model also for ASEAN because ASEAN UNINET uh, was founded before AUN, perhaps you know AUN, the ASEAN University Network. And the AUN was founded because of the success of Asia Uninet, because the first president uh, of AUN, uh, Professor Suprachai, he was so active in Asia Uninet and he said, okay, we should do it within ASEAN. So for you, perhaps interesting is we have uh, grants to offer, especially the Ernst Mach grant worldwide and the Ernst Mach Grant ASEA Uninet, where we give some scholarships for uh, PhD students or for a whole PhD to stay in Austria. And of course, a large number of short-term research visits. And as you can see, the number of projects uh, performed bilaterally with Indonesia is quite high and is always st is still rising. We have some nice uh, uh, highlights uh, in cooperation. So we did the uh, Afandi con conservation. Uh, Afandi, as you know, is one of the most important painters of Indonesia. Unfortunately, both the Museum Afandi and his paintings are in a bad shape because of, of climate reasons, because of uh, water problems, etc. And now, uh, since many years, Austria is uh, doing some restoration of the art and architecture of the Afandi Museum, doing the whole measurements with laser, etc. So we, because there are no uh, blueprints of this museum, so everything is now uh, very, very precisely 
per, to the millimeter uh, measured by our laser technicians with 3D laser scanners. So we do also this kind of things. Uh, what we also do in, in, in medicine, we have a very successful cancer prevention uh, program. Uh, we are uh, with, with the uh, Gajamada, we have also agricultural uh, uh, research areas. And with ITB, uh, many, many, but I want to stress one of them. That is uh, where Fajr Ikaputra was also uh, part of it, where we do some digital learning for school children with very new concepts. And this was very, very successful. And uh, ETB was very active here uh, to disseminate this kind of concept. Head in the cloud, uh, just got the nomination and the winning as the European Union success story for education, for distant education and education for this kind of children. So now this is just to, to give you an impression about uh, ASEA Uninet and about the close relationship between ITB, the Indonesian universities in general, but especially ITB and uh, the, my university, and also the very uh, vivid relationship in the area of IT. So now I want to start with the real presentation and with giving you also an impression of uh, the usability of the concepts. So I want to speak about linked data enterprise network. So first, a little bit about linked data. There will be also a, uh, an introduction uh, if the, the, to, to, for, for those who are not so accustomed with, with this concept. Uh, but what we want to propagate is that linked data is really something which can be used uh, for practical purposes for enterprises. So, so the linked data enterprise is a potential for both intra-organizational and inter-organizational business data integration and usage. So with the linked data concept, one can uh, work within the organization and also between organization in different kind of uh, business models like supply chain or others. So what we want to speak here is, is there a potential for enterprise linked data within the enterprise and between enterprises and perhaps even in the future in a network of enterprises? So like in tourism, you can imagine eh? you, you have the flight, you have the hotel, you have the, the trips, you have the, the visits to the mountains or whatever, hiking, uh, all this kind of thing can be integrated within a network, but also within the uh, travel agencies, etc. This could be used in a very good way. So what we can see here is it is always about data and data is, is I would say, the most important feature of today's economy, as you know, many people speak about this is the new oil. Uh, so for efficient data management is the key for economic success. And, but there is a problem. And most of the um, research efforts are focused on this problem that data are defined with different metadata. And it is very difficult to exchange data from one silo to another. So since the beginning of the uh, data modeling approaches some 50 years ago when the relational model was defined, uh, the main aim was always to bridge this gap between the silos. And 
the traditional enterprise information system reach already their limits. And unfortunately, and this is a pity, less than 10% of digital knowledge is available within organizations. As you know, some people have their Excel files just for them alone uh, and defined in a way that cannot be used by others. So the, the question was, could we use also the World Wide Web architecture for the data to integrate the data as a promising solution? So this is from the very beginning the idea. And perhaps uh, to cite somebody who was all, also sometime in Indonesia, Barack Obama, uh, he was in some way quite prophetic in 2009 when he said, okay, what we need is that we need a system of transparency, participation, collaboration, and with openness, and with openness, he, he meant something like open government open governmental data. So all data which are not secret in the sense of defense or other reasons should be made public. And making it public means it should be in a way understandable to all the stakeholders. And this is the problem of linked data, linked open data. So, so, according to Obama, so if we have this kind of things, if data is available uh, for more and more people, this will help to launch a lot of business, new businesses. And uh, literally, say it is going to help more entrepreneurs come up with products and services that we haven't even imagined yet. So if we know exactly where you are, et cetera, uh, this is something which is very, very important. And as you have seen also uh, in Indonesia, uh, new uh, solutions and approaches like, like Gojek, et cetera, are only possible if we have this very nice possibilities of interchange of data. And this started with Obama already 2013. And so at that time, open governmental data was very propagated and uh, open government partnerships were started. And uh, in very short time, it contains already more than 88 countries uh, some 10 years ago with UK, Indonesia and Philippines uh, starting with, with small uh, examples, but there was the tendency to say, okay, we want to join this kind of open governmental data, which is also important for international exchange of data. So you can, and now in the, in the COVID era, it is even more important. So, so it is something really important for uh, knowledge sharing and Politically, it's also important because it has also the power to fuel greater transparency, collaboration between the different uh, stakeholders, municipalities, uh, groups of people. And last but not least, this is perhaps uh, an engine for a new economy activity. So 2015, then the Open Data Charter was founded. And the idea was that we say data should be opened by default. And at least uh, as a lip service, more than 70 governments have joined the movement. So to embed the culture and practice of openness in governments in ways that are resilient to political change and driven by user demand. So, and some countries like Australia, not Austria, Australia, are very strict in this. So whenever one Australian dollar is spent somewhere and there are no reasons against it, a good example is perhaps the zoo of Sydney. So all the data should be available for the public. So whenever there's a subsidy from the government, those uh, enterprises uh, and 
stakeholders should open their data. Of course, if there are some reasons against it, it is not possible, but this should be done. And this will give a push for new innovations and new business. So the Open Data Charter has this kind of six principles for how government should be published information. It should be, whenever possible, open by default. It should be timely and comprehensive. It should be accessible and usable. It should be comparable and interoperable. That is the most important issue for you as uh, computer science students to make how to make this interoper inter interoperable. How can we define, if we speak in data, this schema so that one schema can be understood by another schema and we can work together with the same data? How should we do the definition of the metadata? And number five, for improved governance and citizen engagement. It's also important in the area of uh, citizen science, especially uh, Indonesia is doing also some efforts on this. And for inclusive development. And last but not least, it is a driver for innovation. And this goes on. So in 2013, so after Obama, uh, the Open Data Charter was defined by the G8. This is, you have the G7. At that time, there was still G8 because Russia was still there and was kicked out after this. Uh, but the G8 uh, countries were agreed to say, okay, we should be uh, committed to open data. And Europe uh, is still very much committed on this. Uh, and this is now, I think, a global movement both by government, for governmental data, for statistics especially, very important. Statistics should be made available for all. Uh, and um, as I told you, so most countries are now very much behind this. So these are the, the principles I told you before. Uh, so open data can be freely used, modified and shared by anyone for any purpose. This could be perhaps the most concise definition. And this would need uh, the uh, ingredients for reuse and redistribution uh, to make it available for universal participation. Because to say everyone must be able to use it, you must uh, prepare it in a way that this should be quite easy, and we have to guarantee availability and access. So Austria, some years ago, we have this kind of open government data. So in Austria, so all pathways in the city of Vienna, this is just for Vienna, are uh, public. So you can see for every meter, if you want, yeah, uh, what is this uh, condition of the streets, of the pathway, and even the layers uh, beneath to geographical information systems which are open. Uh, all uh, big trees in Vienna are also uh, uh, stored and available for access. So there are many, many possibilities, uh, catalogs for this kind of data. And now this was a few years ago, and this is uh, the screenshot from yesterday. So here, it is unfortunately in German, but you can see all the data of the uh, public transport. And very interesting, uh, the COVID-19 checkbox uh, is also here and it's one of the most important one. And as you can see here for the checkboxes, you see the many, many, many formats for the COVID-19, whereas uh, the others are just by, by spreadsheets and JSON. But here you see the variety of possibilities to access this kind of data. So open data is a global trend. We have uh, cities, international organizations, national and European portals, conferences, everything. and. Uh, Many, many countries are very much committed uh, to open data. This is also true for the ASEAN countries, which are not here 
on the slide, unfortunately. So the other thing is if we have the data, the next step would be to say, okay, what should I do with this data, which then we, the more open data are available, the more uh, it becomes abundant, it becomes huge, it will be big data. And what can I do with big data? Uh, I think most of you are accustomed with this kind of tax mining, tax analytics, if it is uh, tax data, uh, where we are now in a situation where information extraction, uh, question answering systems, etc., are uh, quite feasible. Uh, audio analytics, video analytics, web networks, social media analytics with all its pro and cons. We can discuss about this if you want later on. And most importantly, this kind of availability of big data will lead to what is called predictive analytics. So we can, due to the abundant number of data, we can use modern techniques uh, like data mining and others to predict analytics and perhaps even the next step which is even the more interesting one where now mo many many scientists are working on is not only the predictive analytics but also the prescriptive analytics so that what can i do to better the situation somewhere what what could be the next step out of the data uh, i have found due to have some possible blueprints of reactions of predictive analytics. But as you can see, problem is still data. And the, you can see here, besides the methodologic things, the ability to get the data is still a very big barrier. Then there are the concerns with data. Then people don't know where to start. And so these are the problems and the problems are still quite similar even now. So we need something like a governance to support this big data initiative throughout the company. Define clear data management procedures storage, availability, processing, sharing, how, what can I share? Because open data is nice, but perhaps sometimes there are some barriers if we have problems, for example, compliance with privacy issues. If we have this kind of privacy issues, how can I work? But it would be another lecture uh, that my data is still protected even more if we have sensitive data like health data so we would need concepts like anonymization and how could we do this do it, that we can work in a good way but uh, for analysis but it will not be possible to disclose my private data and this is now especially in europe perhaps you have also uh, uh, heard about this, the GDPR, the General Directive on uh, Privacy. Um, so in Austria and in Europe, this is, say, our, uh, our basis for the protection of privacy. So in the usage is how to extract for business intelligence. How can we train the people? And that is especially for you from ITB, how to ask the right questions. I think one of the most important things uh, at universities is always the issue of asking the right questions. What data is relevant? And so there is a need of, for data scientists and experts at uh, my universities, at TU Wien, Vienna University of Technology, we just started 
a master degree in data science, where students bachelor from all other studies, from civil engineering, from physics, from chemistry, from mechanical engineering, they all can start this data science uh, master. Uh, and, it's, and we expected just a handful of students, but already in the first year, it was last year, we have more than 300 uh, applicants for data scientists. So the, the need of data science in all engineering faculties is evident. Important also analysis might not provide immediate results. That is always a problem. We can see it also now in this pandemic. So, and now slowly we go to the semantic web research focus areas. So what is needed for the semantic web? Why we need semantic web? We need semantic web as we have seen before, especially to harmonize the metadata, data about the data, so that people can work together. If somebody works with temperatures in Celsius and somebody else is working in another country with Fahrenheit, then we should know that these are two different uh, numbers which must be uh, transformed. So that's why the semantic of the data is the essence for working with big data. And therefore, we need the ontologies and the modeling. You need semantic web services. We need linked data to link entities to entities. So if it is uh, I'm sure here, and there is another I'm sure it should be possible to say, okay, this is the same guy, so we can link them if it is the same. Or if somewhere my sister is there, then it should be nice to know, okay, this guy is linked to the other person as a sibling. So then this kind of web can grow and we can work very, very uh, efficient in the sense of big data, but with a maximum on, on precision. So then matching and integration, security, trust and provenance is also a big issue. Uh, I will not uh, go very deep in this, but this is perhaps one of the most important issues um, for working with big data uh, because the especially if we speak about data about persons uh, because the disclosure of privacy is one of the most uh, largest threats for uh, this kind of things uh, as you know facebook google and others uh, there capital is the data they have and until now it is predominantly uh, the US companies uh, who has this kind of data Europe to be honest is very much behind for this because we don't have this kind of uh, social networks and others so the, it is dominated uh, by US companies but nevertheless, uh, many of the inventions came from, from, from Europe, of course. So to define linked data in a way, and here I cite Bitzer, uh, who is, I think, the specialist uh, after Tim Berners-Lee, that is linked data can be defined as the set of best practices for publishing and connecting structured data on the web. So as I told you, we want to connect structured data on the web. We have to know about their semantics in some way to start to link them. 
On the other side, and this is perhaps the, the, the most important thing, uh, and historically perhaps interesting, Tim Berners-Lee originally was very uh, uh, driven and by the idea of the semantic web. To say, okay, if everything is an RDF, etc., then we would have a perfect world. Uh, where, uh, especially also at that time, in his uh, article on, in the Scientific American, uh, that he said, okay, then uh, every device can speak with another device. So if, this was his example, if I turn my radio or TV set on and then uh, my phone is ringing, then automatically, because the radio can understand my phone that there is is sending something, that then the radio or television set would mute automatically because this is ringing. So devices could understand each other. And he was very much convinced that semantic web with nice ontologies, with RDF, would solve this problem quite fast. The reality was quite different. RDF was not used uh, very popularly. So he stepped one step back and said, OK, uh, I was wrong in the sense that semantic web is not so accepted. It is perhaps too difficult or not even too difficult to too much efforts uh, are necessary and people, uh, industry and people are not so interested to do it. So take the other approach like he did it with the web. Let the web just grow and we will use it uh, in, in, in our different ways. So he redefined his first concepts of okay, semantic web is perhaps something for tomorrow at that time. Let us start with linked data. And he defined this kind of linked data principles. Uh, the four of you see here. So use URI as the name of things. Use HTTP URI so that people can look up those names. And when someone looks up a URI, provide useful information, include links to other URIs so that they can discover more things. So just link data with data. This was his idea. So in a very quick and dirty uh, approach in some way. So this was his idea. And as we can see, this idea uh, grow quite fast. In a few years, we have this kind of situation. And so millions and millions uh, of people are working already with it, and a lot of data sets are there. Uh, and now we can think about, OK, and it is uh, Momo Momo who said, OK, we have something like this kind of data cycle. We extract the data, we storage, we make a revision, we interlink it, we enrich it. We make a quality analysis, we repair things, we do the exploration, and then we have a new extraction again. So it is enrichment by itself. And this is, I think, good for today's economy, where we have this fast product life cycles, uh, and especially in the sense of globalization. So we would need more and more data-centric enterprises. And, and this is the thesis we have here, uh, that open data could be perhaps one of its enablers. So data, as you all know, uh, is an invaluable asset. And we expect a web of interconnected data sources. So that is what we would want to have. Why? Why traditional 
enterprise information systems are no more capable to scale effectively. So we apply the web architecture to data integration system as promising solutions. So the linked data approach is the solution. Also, it is out of its nature rough and dirty. And now we can think about the next step. Perhaps we can use having intelligent people within our organization, people with their own ideas, with their own will. Perhaps it would be nice to have an enterprise-wide data network for internal and external data stakeholders. And we could encourage, and this is perhaps the real strength as we have seen it with the web, the development of web is so successful because the people are encouraged to create and share the websites, etc. And out of a sudden, the web was growing. Nobody has predicted it, even not Tim Berners-Lee, because this was the web was invented for scientists at the beginning, not for the general public, but because of its easiness. Uh, because of the possibility to connect. So this is in the next step of Tim Berners-Lee after his invention of the web to say, okay, try it with a semantic web, which is still, I think, a, of course, as we know, a very good approach. But in the meantime, we can do it with linked data. Of course, most important, uh, and all of you who has uh, joined statistic courses know the most important uh, thing about data is uh, the cleanness of the data, the integrity of the data, the necessary plausibility checks about data. So never store data which are more precise, rougher, if it is not really necessary. And always try to check the data you are entering. So this is, I think, one of the most important things for uh, working with big data to be always very clear what is the meaning of the data. So if we have an unknown value in a relation, for example, we have to think about why is this attribute of this entity unknown? And there are a lot of semantics of unknown values, for example. It could be data is missing. It could be this data is not available. It could be the data is not yet uh, not yet input. It could be it is forbidden, yeah, because for this kind of disease or for this kind of type of persons, this is not relevant. This is just for women and this is a man, so this data is therefore uh, blank. Perhaps then we have already a mistake in our data modeling. Perhaps we should make some. Uh, sub entities, all these kinds of things are important and is topic of the data curation. So the completeness is important. More important, in my opinion, is the accuracy and consistency. Interpretation, of course, uh, we should always know uh, that there are of contradictory and ambiguous data. And uh, more and more, the provenance of data. If I say, okay, this data about Corona came from uh, the John Hopkins U University, it is different than I say, okay, this data is coming from an unknown city. So this is, I think, also important. So what was it done at our university, many years ago already started, is uh, to start a link widget platform. We try uh, to make modular building blocks 
for data acquisition, processing, visualization. Uh, it is web-based, it is user-friendly, it is graphical, it is powerful. And uh, it is something like a mashup. Uh, what we try to do is to make building blocks like Lego building blocks, where you can put these building blocks together in a very easy way, also for people without much knowledge about data semantics. So if you ask in an open data platform uh, a question like this, find a park, and, then we, and we did it really many years ago already with Link Open Data, find a park with good air quality 700 meters near my home or near, near my office. So this is a very difficult question normally. But if I have the ingredients to say, okay, I have something like, oh, sorry, I have something like location and every building block has outwards and inputs like this. And the outputs and inputs are semantically matching. So there is possible. Then we can do it in a very, very nice way. And so, okay, we choose the location. Um, and then there's a maximum distance, like I don't know how many meters. Then I have the air quality. And then I can say, okay, you can go here. So this is uh, the way we are doing it. Uh, so we have one widget for location and map pointer. We have one widget for the air quality. We can merge them. And we can use, for example, Google Map for its visualization because we can use this output as here input. So if we can try to find this kind of quasi mashups, which are an extension of it, this was our first attempt. And then we have many, many, many other examples which are quite difficult. So find, uh, I want to ride with a city bike and then go swimming and good air quality should be provided. We can do it in a very nice way. So what is, uh, so what can we do with this kind of things? Uh, ideally at the end we can construct enterprise-wide networks of linked data for employees and stakeholders. We have of course, the central information knowledge hub. And then we can increase collaboration, of course, because people can use these building blocks and build their own application in a nice way out of the data. More, most importantly, of course, is that the data should be uh, cleansed uh, so that we can get the right results. So then, the problem of silos is no more there because data is open and stakeholders can work with this data in a nice way. But this can also be used for manufacturing of sensor data. And now we have a future lab at Technical University of Vienna where we use a similar concept for Internet of Things uh, in an excellent center. But in principle, the uh, basis is still like this. You have the data, you have the workflow in this case, and where can we uh, plunge the data at the right moment to the workflow? And this is, uh, I think, really something uh, which will continue, it will be easier and easier. So there will be more and more libraries for this kind of data exploration, much ups and further analysis. So for the Internet of Things, and that is what we will speak afterwards, we will deal a lot with this kind of problems. Another application would be open journalism. So how 
could journalists integrate data from different sources into reusable linked widgets for data mashup, which can embed into data storage. So if a journalist needs some new statistics to make it easy, then he can just take the different uh, open data chunks, take a mashup and say, okay, I have this kind of, I don't know, Corona data from Austria, and I want to compare it with Corona data from uh, US. And uh, especially I am interested in this and this, and this should be uh, linked to the uh, geographical locations uh, dependent on the largeness of the cities, for example. So is there something like similarity of largeness of cities and infection and just and normally you would need uh, real help of some uh, expert from computer science or informatics but the goal would be that this can be done by the journalists themselves and this is also one of the projects where uh, Fajar Ekaputra is also working on also on this kind of open data for open journalism and quite successfully the project is still uh, going on. So these are real things uh, which will make uh, our business life much easier and much broader because interaction between open data will be very very easy and we can conclude things which are not possible until now or only possible with a lot of effort uh, if you think people working on SF, SPSS, BMDP, System R, etc. First you have always the data part is the, at least of equal importance than the statistics itself. So, so it is always the getting data, using data and delivering data stories for the journalism. The journalists are interested to, uh, to write their stories every day if it is a newspaper. And therefore, they need uh, tools uh, which enable them to do it in, a, in an easy manner. And that is this, what is called by our colleagues, the Odmojo platform uh, for data journalism. Uh, using open data uh, with the help of this kind of link widgets or uh, further development of the link widgets. So here we, we have other examples, a uh, link widget for the air quality in Vienna, etc. Also done uh, with a mashup in the Otmojo. So with this, uh, the journalist can write, okay, the cold January, uh, this time has a lot of pollution uh, of, uh, of fine dust, and then you can give the data on it, etc., in, in a very easy way. Huh? So, for journalists, this is a real treasure to have the possibility to use this kind of widgets. So, but now the question is further could Link data also be something which is usable for the further development of businesses or business infrastructure, IT infrastructure, information system inter infrastructure. So there's a question, is there a potential for first in-house application for link data enterprises? Why not using a perfect link data infrastructure for in-house application? Open it, do it. Or furthermore, if this is possible, why not also using it for the communication between stakeholders, between business entities between companies. So then we, we would have to, to differentiate between the intra-enterprise using 
the enterprise link data within one entity, business entity, or inter enterprise, the link enterprise data, so that we can use it for uh, data exchange. In some way, I don't know uh, how many of you are dealing with EDI and, and EDIFAC, electronic data interchange, and there are standards from the United Nations and used by so that. Uh, suppliers for the automotive, etc. They have the they have their different formats. How to interchange between the suppliers and the automotive companies, etc. Which is working quite good. But this could also be, if you do it openly in a nice, nice way, this could be also a basis for something like a link enterprise data network. But this is still something uh, we have still in mind and it is, we have to prove if this, this could be successful or not. There are many, many applications where this is already possible, but to construct the backbone of a company or a group of companies by a link enterprise data network is something like still a vision where we want to go. So we have to differentiate between enterprise link data, working with data within the company, within the organization. So we have heterogeneous system at the data level and advanced content management basis for innovative products and services. So people can work within the company in a nice way. And on the other side, the link enterprise data, inter-enterprise, between enterprises, between different stakeholders, yeah? perhaps even in some way, sometimes even competitive, competitors. Yeah? So then we have an another issue about what should be totally open, open within the community, or how could we do it? So there are many, many uh, issues to be solved in the same way like EDI, the electronic data interchange. So it's, the issue is the cross-organizational data integration, data markets and data ecosystems. So this, this will be also one of the most important uh, businesses, data markets, and the decentralized infrastructure for network economy. So in some way, this could be the backbone of what is so desired, the network economy. And at the end, if we have both the intra and inter-enterprise, we are aiming at the link enterprise data network. So let us, let us explore in a very superficial way in this talk about the possibility possibilities. So first, what are the key requirements? We have to analyze the potential of this and we do it in a way, uh, perhaps some of you know this business model canvas, which was uh, propagated by Pinyua. Uh, which is, I think, for all people who want to start a business, it would be always the best to, to write your uh, business model via Canvas because it is easy and it is really solid. And we have this kind of building blocks. We have the key requirements, measured purpose, key stakeholders, benefits for stakeholders. It is how we begin to write a business model. So what are the key requirements? Technologically, we can say we have the linked data principles. We need the semantic interoperability of all the heterogeneous data sources. This is the real Herculean task. Very difficult. We have vocabularies, 
taxonomies, ontologies, to capture the knowledge domain, all are very different, as I told you. The, the, the example with Celsius and Fahrenheit is easy, but sometimes uh, some data are granular, granular, some data are of a finer granularity, and then we have to integrate them. So if I have one data is about one province, the other data is about just the, the different uh, municipalities of the province, then how to do, then we have to sum up, etc. So this kind of things must be solved in a very uh, general way. And we have to consult with experts because this can only be done with experts. So if we uh, do some work with pharmacologists or people from agriculture, we have to know what is meant uh, to interchange the data. So we have now uh, just started the digital uh, agriculture lab together with the University of Natural uh, Sciences. Uh, and this is a, it's a problem because you have the, the data coming from the drones, you have the data for, about, and this must be, this must be integrated in a smooth way. So the existing vocabularies, the terminology must be understood. And we have to know a clear division of tasks and responsibilities to guarantee this kind of semantic interoperability. So, and tools we need are uh, the facilitation of search and discovery of data. We need, again, like uh, we did it with the widgets, a very user-friendly graphical interface. So the usability is always one of the key issues. Then, uh, the extensible and compatible with various systems, because stakeholders have already their systems. And last but not least, but this will not be the topic here, is uh, the issues of privacy and security and trust. Other aspects are the quality of data. As I told you, this is the key. Always the key is the quality of the data, the, the integrity of the data, use of plausibility checks from the very beginning for every attribute and uh, again the protection from misuse has to do more with with security i think yeah, so quality but nowadays security is always a, a key issue then we have of course the management aspects uh, what, what kind of resources are needed etc the division of responsibilities and tasks. But if you start such a project, of course, that's why this kind of transfers by Pinyur is so helpful. We just have uh, these key requirements, key reservations, etc., and we, we get out of a sudden a very clear picture of the problem. And then we have, of course, organizational and human related aspects. Uh, always with every modernization, the reluctance of the employees. We have always the division between the enthusiasts and those who are reluctant. And much more difficult, the enthusiasts are sometimes the most reluctant if there's a drawback. After the first drawback, many of the enthusiasts will give up. So this is also is even evidence-based that the enthusiasts if they have their drawbacks a significant percentage then will give up so that's why we must be very very cautious also with the organizational and human related aspects so this was the key requirement what are the key reservations Technologically, is the technology transfers to, to users and stakeholders. The people supposed to work with linked data technology don't understand it. So we have that education is important. 
the proof of knowledge demonstrating how technology works, data aspect, incompatibility of data. So this is, of course, important in the same way as the quality of data before. So we have the quality of data, but also the incompatibility of data. We should know if data cannot be used to be joined together, then they are not, they are two different things. And again, security aspect, which is not the topic here. And the anonymization of data could be very often uh, possibility. Nevertheless, with uh, sophisticated statistical methods, some, some anonymized data could be disclosed. So we should know how to do it. There are this concept by some people have, uh, in the audience know this kind of key anonymity, etc. So these are concepts which are existent and which should be used. So now we go to further in the canvas. What are the measures proposed? So we, we should have a proof of the technology's added value. We are doing it for some purpose. It must be the visibility, the accessibility. So especially the accessibility. So because what, why are we doing this? Because we want to make more and more data accessible. And employees should understand why they need semantic models and technologies. Why they have to do this kind of work. Because it is... Of course, some work to make data interchangeable. Yeah? You have to use the same metadata. And then, of course, we have uh, measurements of the manager, managerial level and also governmental level. So we have to do some data policies, a common standard. And if it is a governmental project, we have to be very cautious with the data policy, which data is really available for the public, which not also, of course, for companies. And then we have to set incentives for providing open data. So somebody, if you do the work to open your data, there must be a benefit. Otherwise, why should I do all this work? And of course, we need the, to evangelize it. And the benefit, of course, and that is why we are doing this, is a much more efficient data management with all the uh, advantages pointed out here and even more. So we have, and this is ultimately always one thing, but we will have enough to work anyway. It will reduce the dependency of IT experts because once we have this kind of very easy tools, we can work uh, with less IT experts. But of course, new applications will come, new uh, requirements will be the outspring of this kind of link enterprise data network. And of course, always uh, from the financial point of view, the desire to save cost and time. And I think this is perhaps even the most important that due to this kind of architecture, uh, it can be foreseen, I think, even that new business opportunities will uh, flourish, as already seen by Obama some, I don't know, 12 years ago. Yeah? So open data will trigger a number of new business opportunities. And if open data will become the heart of companies and also of the uh, workflow between stakeholder companies, then uh, we will have a boost of new business opportunities. At least this is the theory. So now, I come to a more other issue is how should we do this kind of data management of open data, at least for scientific data. So the University of Vienna uh, is relying 
to the fair and care principles of scientific data management. Now I'm speaking about scientific data. So we are trying in Vienna to open all the data, scientific data, as much as possible. As you know, more and more journals in the area of chemistry and physics, they only accept papers if the data are open, because then you can uh, clarify and check if the hypothesis uh, described in the paper are true or not. So you can uh, follow the ideas there and even perhaps falsify it or further deepen this. So that's why there is this kind of uh, definition of what is called the fair principles of scientific uh, metadata. What does it mean? Fair. Fair means, sorry, findable. So the metadata are assigned are globally unique and eternally persistent identified. Data are in this way uh, always rich with metadata described with very rich metadata uh, or sufficient metadata and metadata are registered index in a searchable resource. So, the, so in, in the ways we know exactly if with this uh, micros, electronic micros, microscope, this data with this kind of parameter uh, was measured. So all the parameters should be known with every measurement. If it's the medicine, I should know what, who is the patient, what was the methodology for measuring this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, the metadata are crucial. Then it should be accessible. So metadata are retrievable by the identifier using a standardized com communication protocol. The protocol must be open, free, and universally implementable. The protocol allows for an authentication and authorization procedure. Where necessary, metadata are accessible, even when data are no longer available. So the metadata should always be uh, accessible. Uh, this is also true, for example, for uh, CERN if we speak about particle physics. So you can work with CERN in Geneva from wherever you are, from Bandung, from, from, what, from whatever city, because these data are open. And the metadata, more importantly, are described very, very clearly. And it should be interoperable and interoperable. So metadata use a formal, accessible, shared, and broadly applicable applicable language for knowledge representation and it should be reusable. So this was the FAIR principles and perhaps I have to say for the European Union this was already uh, taken as mandatory. So for research data in the next years, this was the final report, is we, will, we want to turn the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for the metadata, this should be mandatory. So I think it would be good to know. And this could also be used in some way also for our link open data network, wherever it is uh, adequate. And then there is another new principle uh, by the third world. Uh, some indigenous uh, communities say, okay, that is nice, but where are the ethics if we use this kind of fair data for science, etc.? So they defined some other additional principles, which are more the ethical principles. So it should be of collective benefit. There must be an authority to control. There must be the responsibility, but, and there should be a lot of ethics. But it is now, it turns out, not only important for indigenous people, but this could also be used for 
data and metadata collection in general. So the University of Vienna, we use both the FAIR principles and the CARE principles. So this is the European Union action plan, how to do it. I will not bother you with the details. So there's first you have to define it. There's concepts for FAIR implementation. Then you have to implement it, means there's a FAIR culture, a FAIR ecosystem, and there's, there are the needed skills for FAIR. These are all about metadata for scientific data. So this is really, that is not a dream. This is something real. We have to do this if we work with scientific data. It is for the companies. We just spoke before. This is still uh, something we want to achieve and we don't know if we will achieve it. But for scientific data, this is already standard. Uh, in Europe and elsewhere. And yes, an incentive and metrics should be defined. And then uh, should also, of course, there must be something like implementation. So to conclude this first part, link enterprise data is predominantly used for more efficient enterprise content management, for recommending related data sets on semantic models. To embed also, I don't speak a lot about this, but sensor data from various sources into one data model. So we did it also for uh, pollution, for example. So we have uh, an own model for pollutions uh, with this kind of widgets. Answer unusual question to run complex analysis, the example of uh, open journalism. It is for the enterprise still, a long way to go. I don't think it is a long way to go for scientific data. And an increasing number of enterprises start to adopt this kind of technologies uh, motivated by public institutions. So the necessity for linked data in enterprises as traditional data management system reach the limit. So this is uh, what I want to say. And perhaps another conclusion, uh, link open data have huge potential. However, the uptake is accepted to be slow. Uh, it is, of course, transformational. The implementation is very, very costly. It's not cheap, I think, yeah? at, at the beginning for the pioneers. We need solid know-how, expert and tools. And that's why we need good universities to do it, like ETB or universities elsewhere, Vienna. Many enterprises reluctant to share company internal data. This is always the, the problem. So if you say, I want to work together, uh, this is always some reluctance to say, what is the benefit? So the benefit must be that the, the sum of the efforts must be uh, in a way reach even a greater benefit. Otherwise, there's no uh, economic intensive. So this is, in a nutshell, what I want to say. Are there questions to part one? OK, thank you very much, Professor Choa. Is there a question? Faris, uh, silakan. Faris Rizky Ekananda. You may unmute yourself. Oh. Oh, you can write on the chat? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's using the chat. There are many countries. There are many countries that have joined this open government data, but how do they implement this? Is there any manuals or postures for this? Do the government need to have laws for this? I've used some open data resources in the past, but most of them are very dirty. Is it because of the lack of standardization from the, gov the government? Mm -hmm. That's the question yeah, is... from Faris. Thank you, Faris. It's... Thank you, Faris. As a, I think this is a real good question. It is the essence. Uh, as I 
pointed out before, of course, the most important thing is to, to have the data as clean as possible. Yeah? On the other side, uh, the starting point of, of the linked data initiative is that before, if we are too rigid, yeah, then we will get some, some problems in, 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 in getting people participating. So we are, we are in this kind of dilemma. And of course, uh, for government, uh, it is a, a, a task, I think, uh, and it is worthwhile to have a budget to do this. So the city of Vienna, for example, is very much, also not from the very beginning, but more and more they are getting enthusiastic because this is bringing a lot of benefits. The best way would be, of course, to say, okay, if I, I, and the, I, I mentioned the Australian model, if there is some government, government money spent somewhere, then it should be mandatory to do it. And then, of course, we have to do some teaching, of course, because many, and sometimes it is uh, the openness of the data is triggered by some uh, some reasons which are not so pleasant. Like we had a corrupt corruption scandal in, in Salzburg in Austria, yeah, where some uh, employee did some speculation on 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 government money, and and then it it. It was, it was a disaster. And after this, now uh, government is very, very keen to make all the data open because this was such a disaster. Eh? So sometimes out of bad things, uh, uh, this kind of, because in some way there is no real uh, force to say, why should I make the data open? We can live until now like this, but for data like pollution, data like uh, like MIT is now doing something which is I think quite nice uh, one of our uh, former PhDs I mean Anjum Shoa he was at MIT and that, that take sensors on the uh, garbage uh, trucks and the garbage trucks are uh, uh, driving through Boston and out of this data, which they make open, uh, you can detect most of the pollution problems, etc., without using too many sensors. Yeah. So sometimes with some bright ideas, uh, you can even spare some money yeah, by cooperation with the uh, with, with, with the, with with this kind of trucks, companies, etc. So also some public-private partnerships, etc. could be uh, a nice way even uh, to reduce costs. But you are right, it is very difficult. It is in some way the same problem which you have with statistical offices or uh, scientific data in, in medicine, pharmacology, etc. You need some stuff to clean the data. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Uh, I think there's no further question. Yeah, uh, so uh, then would you like to I will continue, continue with the part two? Yeah. The, next, the next part. Yeah, I hope I, I will come through because I have four parts. <laughs> 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 yes, I'm beginning to wonder because it's already like for for thirty here. <laughs> yes, okay, please so go we, on, professor. So, so we have one half. So we, I, I, I will, I will. What? I have some problems. Hop, 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 hop. I think you have to change your pointer. Yeah. I don't want any pointer to be honest. I don't know what happened. Yes, yes, now it's great. Okay, so now give a nice uh, overview on the evolution of semantic web technologies. These slides uh, 
is what we use also for our students uh, uh, on the semantic web. Uh, I think I can go a little bit faster through. So we have this kind of web of documents. Uh, this looks like this. Yeah? We have so many uh, uh, sources, yeah? as you can see. I, do, I hope you can see it. Yeah? We have this uh, data about uh, environment. We have the national parks. We have the Con conservation fund. We have uh, Greenpeace, World Wildlife Fund, Rainforest Action Network, United Nations Population Fund. All of these people, they have their data. And now, and they are publishing the this, this data. And now the question is, how could I put all this data together? Yeah. This is the lady who, who did uh, the slides in this part, Marta Sabu. Yeah. She is a very uh, renowned expert already, I would say, uh, in, in the area of, of knowledge graphs and, and uh, citizen science. And, and so, so a very high each index. So the examples he gives is if you put her name, Marta Sabu, yeah, then you have here Marta Sabu's homepage. Uh, there's some Sabu uh, which is nothing to do with her. Yeah? And then you have the Sabu department. Uh, they are all different. So the key problem is, and come also to your question, the meaning of web content is not machine, it is lack of semantics. It is simply difficult for a machine to distinguish the meaning between the two senses. I am a professor of computer science. I am a professor of a computer science, you may think. Well, something like this. If there is a, a two sentences in a, in a newspaper, that this, this, this means the same. So, and what is with, with this kind of machine? So this is really difficult. So what we need is, as, as ever, we need the meta, metadata is the key. The metadata is the key and we should, if the metadata uh, is there and is done in a proper form, then we have what we call machine understandable form. And that is what we are striving at. And this was uh, the starting was, as I told Tim Berners-Lee, semantic web. This was theoretically perfect but the problem was if you look to the data 2001 how long does it take until uh, a representative percentage of the web pages are in rdf that is the problem so but starting with this it is the history say okay he say as an extension of current web in which information is given well-defined meaning better enabling computers and people to work in cooperation. So what is the question? What semantic web will gradually evolve out of existing web? It is not a competition to the current web. No, it is, some, it is an add-on. How? Represent web content in a form that is more easily machine processable. Why? An open platform allowing information to be shared and processed. So now we, we are going like here. So we, we can link one node to another, uh, but we still don't have, we, we need something like ontologies to capture the semantics. Ontologies is something like the conceptualization of our, uh, of our chunks. So if I have to say the ontology uh, is something like the basis of semantics, yeah? to have the terminology link to the ontology. And we need something, a, st a standard syntax. That is what he has defined, X XML, RDF, RDF schema, and all. And lots of resources with metadata attached. So this was what was started. And you can see here uh, that the easiest definition of Ontology is the conceptualization of a domain. So we make, uh, if we say this is an animal, and then there is something like a heart, a misspelling here, or a brain, then we say, okay, 
animal is linked to a body part and body parts. We have these parts, heart, brain, etc., etc. And then animals, we have different kinds of animals. Animals uh, is a subtype, if you want, is a, of a living thing. And then we have the plants, etc., etc. So this is, and then we can say, okay, uh, carnivores only eat animals, etc., etc. So this is why we can define it. And one of the one of the very first uh, ontologies was the friend of friend, yeah? fourth ontology. We have these basics, persons, name, homepage, inbox, etc. And then we have this friend of friend. So this was the starting point uh, of the semantic web. And the idea was we have this kind of layered presentation. Uh, and this was the desire to have something like step-by-step -step increase semantic expressibility. Yeah? And I think, I don't know if you have uh, done all of this, uh, uh, presentation in, in some of the lectures. So the idea of Tim Berners-Lee was to have this kind of ontologization, if you want, of the semantic web. And then the nice thing is then you can go and use logic. If you take, take the example before, you say, okay, this kind of animals only eat other animals. Then I know, okay, this animal, if it is only this will not eat plants. So we can deduce a lot of things already if we do a proper semantic uh, definition. So if I say, okay, I am already married, yeah, then uh, I cannot be single again if there is not something like I am then divorced first. Yeah. All these kind of things can be defined by ontologies. So we, we speak about, and this is the ontology of, of the uh, friend of a friend. Uh, so we can say, okay, there's the, this is our, our Marta Sabu. Yeah? Here's Marta Sabu. She's a family name is Sabu. And her first name, her given name is Marta. So we can already start, and we have already this kind of RDF syntax. So she is now defined, and we know. Marta Sabu is a person, and then uh, we can say, okay, yeah, she is, she is a person. We have this is a relationship, and we have also the given name. So now we know that Marta Sabu is a person with a family name and a given name, Marta, and a family name, Sabu. And there's another friend of friend. Uh, you say, okay, and Marta is now based near Vienna. So now we know a little bit more if we could link this. Yeah? So now we say, okay, Marta Sabu is a person living near Vienna. So in this way, of course, we can do it uh, quite uh, exhaustively. We could, and we did it perhaps to give another example, I, I, I put this, these are slides I put by myself because uh, Fajar did uh, a course for architecture students in Semantic Web. And they did quite nice things to start with, of course, and they are still in working to say, okay, how can we, for example, define the traditional architecture in Flores? And then you have all this kind of traditional architecture in Flores, and there are brick houses and wood houses, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, I don't know, Nagakao, and there are brick workers working in Who are the workers? Who, who, how are people uh, related? There, there are also to tourism in Flores, and tourism in Flores is interested also in traditional architecture. So, so we get a nice picture of all this kind of thing. This is also done for traditional buildings in Sumba. I don't know the details. That is something like Tonkonan, 
minulunian, uh, this uh, the domestic way, and huma. So all this kind of thing can be defined. And if I have this kind of thing uh, exhaustively, then I would have a very nice architecture, uh, traditional architecture ontology of Indonesian architecture, traditional architecture. And then we can link and compare Sumba with Flores, with Minangkabau or something like this. Yeah? And that is what they are doing. And, and this is, of course, still at the beginning. And these are uh, some, uh, some courses uh, which can be uh, visited by the students of the architecture. And now this is even done for the next semester, I think, together even with some universities in Indonesia. So now I want to say, okay, how, how are the uh, development of the, uh, of the link? First, perhaps it is interesting, uh, quite interesting, out of this, uh, DBpedia was perhaps the most important ontology. What was it have been done by the Wikipedia? Uh, Wikipedia, as you know, is our universal encyclopedia. And what was performed by DBpedia is to bring a knowledge extraction out of Wikipedia uh, in the sense of an ontology. So we have exactly this subject, predicate, object, structure as we need it for RDF out of the Wikipedia. So we can then say, okay, Bandung is a city in Indonesia. Yeah? Indonesia is a uh, member of ASEAN. Uh, of ASEAN. Uh, Indonesia is something like this. And, and if you have all this kind of Wikipedia, then we get a very nice uh, basis yeah? for the uh, ontologization, if you want, of our knowledge. And this, this is something I think which is really good. And this, this gave the push, I think, for the uh, semantic web to, to, to be further continued. So he's in Wikipedia. So here you have Vienna in the uh, in the Wikipedia, and now how can we put it into the uh, new structure, which is here underlined in the in the red box. So this is, and you can you can always access this access it in Wikipedia under Wikipedia org. So you get something like a very nice structure already of ontological structure of the Wikipedia. And then the, the, the question is, how could we, how could we link graphs together? And then we could say, okay, yeah, here we have Marta Sabu, she is in Vienna, based near Vienna. And now we can say, okay, this Vienna here, Wien, this is the same as the Wikipedia resource. So the Wikipedia delivers us with the possibility to link the RDF graphs. And this brings us uh, abundance of knowledge of, of, of links within uh, our semantic web. So this was the intention. And then I can, out of this, I can say, okay, knowing, sorry, knowing that this is the same, Wien and Vienna is the same. Now I can even say, okay, if the population of Vienna is, is 1.9 million, then the population of the a city where Marta Sabu is based is also 1.9 million. This is logic. Yeah? And this is a nice thing. So you can use logical concept, descriptional logical concept for uh, once we have this kind of ontologization in the semantic web. And this is in some way, of course, uh, a revolution. But of course, as, as I told you, uh, after some time, uh, Tim Berners-Lee was also a little bit uh, uh, unsatisfied uh, because 
his hope that most of the uh, websites and 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 devices will put the RDF is not fulfilled. Yeah. So then this this came to the. Uh, but nevertheless, we can see there's a nice uh, development of the linked data cloud. Yeah, because this is the the only way. Yeah to surpass the semantic web by this kind of conceptualization. A rough one, of course, using DPpedia, but nevertheless, this has a very nice development. And then he defined, and I think this was a really a piece of genius to say, okay, we will, it will be sufficient to use any data, also to answer the question before, uh, besides uh, the consistency of data. So what can be linked? And he introduced what he called this five-star principle. So first you can link all data of the web and then machine-readable data. And then the next much better one is it is already non-propriety format. It is nearly perfect if it is in RDF. And it is perfect if it is link RDF. To, to repeat, we want to put everybody, we want to embrace all kinds of data, all these five stars, starting even all the data on, which is rebuilt on the web, then machine readable data. If we have some PDF, it is okay, we have some data, okay, we take it. If it is machine readable, done, next one, it is even better to have a non proprietary format. And then if we have four star, we are already in RDF. And if we have link star, you are already there. So that is, some people call it the uh, pay as you go model. Yeah. So everybody can participate. Yeah? So. A PDF is okay. It's a, of course, it's, it's not, not the best way. Then if I have a, a Excel sheet, it is CSV is, is better than Excel because it is non-proprietary. Then we can do RDF. And then if we have RDF, so people can point to individual items. And if we link them together, as we have seen it before with the city of Vienna, then we are already in a very nice situation. So there are many, many applications. I'm running out of time. Uh, the general architecture is that we have this kind of data tire, a logic tire, and a presentation tire. The data tire is defined to the data access component. And with this triple store, yeah, we can do a republication of the components after doing also this kind of, and that is also to answer the question from before, very important, of course, is the cleansing, the data cleansing. Yeah, we have vocabulary mapping, interlinking, but of course, dirty data are not good. So the more we can do the cleansing, the better. And then, of course, due to the possibility of description logic and logic in general, we can do some implications of the data in an easy way. And then, of course, the last way would be the presentation of the data. So very short uh, examples given by Marta and Fajar again. So there are in that industry knowledge graphs, Google knowledge graphs. What is it? We have entity search results with Google, structured information, understand and answer query directly, and personalized re re search results. And this is something which is quite interesting. Uh, for you, you are quite young, but say, I, don't, I think this is some five years ago or six. If you ask Google Einstein, Albert Einstein, or you ask, you just get the answers. But now if you ask, Albert Einstein, then you will get a box where uh, there are some attributes defined. 
like his birthday, like uh, his profession, etc., etc. Yeah? So the most, or if you ask about Bandung, perhaps even, yeah, you will get a box where you have in some way already the knowledge graph. This come out of a sudden, and in, it is in this competition uh, when we did our linked widgets and all these kind of things. Of course, we have we don't have this kind of money, yeah? but in some way they did exactly the same what we have done. So if you ask George Orwell, for example, like here, then you get exactly something which is the knowledge graph. What is it? It is the internal knowledge graph constructed from many sources, normally out of Wikipedia. So it is not very different in the general case from the DBpedia. But of course, this Google knowledge graph is a very powerful instrument and it's exactly the empowerment of this, what we are discussing before. So this is, uh, so what we have done here, uh, I cannot find it. It's, with Marta, this kind of thing can now be done automatically. Yeah? Because at least Google can do it with this kind of knowledge graph. And of course, we can also use it in some way. So there are also industrial knowledge graph. There's the, the Facebook entity graph. So not all this, the big companies are, are doing this kind of thing. And but interestingly also for us, this is the, the, the Springer, Springer Nature Scholarly. Sorry. I have a problem. Yeah, Springer Nature Scholarly. So this is important for, as I told you, for data integration based on linked data technology. So Springer, uh, the publisher is doing a lot in this area. Uh, Amin Anjoshua, whom I have mentioned before, PhD of us, who, who has left us now for MIT. He did also some part with, with Springer on this uh, uh, DBLP. So Springer try to use their knowledge for uh, linked data technologies. And I think, Science is, of course, the first player in, 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 the, in this game. So I have to rush up, unfortunately. I lost time before. So just to say what, we, what are the existing knowledge graphs? We have a lot of knowledge graphs. Uh, most interesting for us is uh, this kind of scientific graph, of course. There are also non-profit ones, but more and more, there are a lot of commercial ones. But of course, academics are still an important one. And that's why uh, we are working quite strong on this. And here you see, uh, as I told you, Marta Sabu, who is one of the real specialists in this area, who, from whom I have also this uh, part of the slides together with Fajar. Uh, she is working in this Dachstuhl uh, discussion group on knowledge graph fellow proposition. So I think the the knowledge graph is really something which can be the core of the use of semantic uh, enriched data. So this is uh, most I have already said. So the da data integration is uh, made feasible through this kind of thing. It can break what we always want, the data silos, ensure the data access and it is the connection tissue, the abstraction layer where all this data can work together. So uh, here perhaps some uh, remark from Gartner. Graph analysis is possibly the single most effective competitive differentiator for organizations pursuing data-driven operation and decision. And here we are again back, if you remember part one, for the linked data enterprise, if we can reach such a level, then we would have a real push 
Perhaps this was also this what Obama had in mind when he was such enthusiastic about this. And of course, in, in data science, uh, this is the most Im important uh, area, I would say. Uh, we have data sources. Uh, to get the data, to explore the data, and perhaps for you as, as IT students, to model the data. So why and who and how? The semantic features simply model building, and we have a richer knowledge grained from richer data. It's getting richer and richer because, as we have seen, if we know Vienna is the same as Wien, and these are the inhabitants, so this net uh, will grow out of itself if it is consistent. So perhaps I am running out of time. Here are some definitions of knowledge graphs. And uh, I will skip this perhaps. Uh, the evolution of semantic web, we have done it. So perhaps to sum up, so what are the knowledge graphs and how do they relate to other technologies? First, there's no globally accepted definition. I skipped this, there are many, many definitions, but in the essence, we have the graphs, the entities and relations as ever, and knowledge, the meaning and semantics encoded. And of course, unambiguous definitions, provenance tracking. So as I say, cleansing will be always one of the main issues. How to build it? Uh, it is based on principles developed in semantic web research, including on the top, I would say the ontologies and semantic representation languages. And what can I do? Yes, this is the connecting tissue, basis for data integration. This is the way how I can enrich it because I know this node can be uh, can be enriched by the other node by an act of this and if it is the same, it is as a, a semantic way, it is, is a relationship or whatever it is, or it is part of. So we know, okay, this, is, this has to do with the, the brain of somebody, with the leg of somebody, but this belongs to the body and the, the body is a living being, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, and this would enable uh, in the long run, the use of this, and because logic can be employed for artificial intelligence in both directions. In the one direction is the use of intelligence because of the abundance of data. On the other side, the other original way of artificial intelligence is as a logic-based inference system. So, and if I have, a, unfortunately I'm running out of time. I was too slow at the beginning. Uh, there is this book. There is this book of Edward Curry uh, on real-time linked data spaces, which is just published two weeks ago. Yeah? And I, I did. Uh, uh, it is an excellent book. It is. Uh, it is available. Uh, it is written by Edward Edward Curry, who is the vice president of Big Data Value Association. It is the European Union uh, institution connecting all. Uh, excellent centers about big data. And what he did uh, is that he advocated the use of a data space paradigm to support sharing of data between intelligent systems with an IoT enabled smart environments. So now it is going on the Internet of Things. Yeah. And uh, what, what he is asking for is, and what he is predicting is. Uh, Sorry, I have some problem. I have a... So that the data space approach is something like now everything has some sensors, everything delivers data, and we have a large scale integration scenario, thousands of data sources, and it's it's very uh, difficult to to unify all this kind of things. And this is what he said, we need something like the coexistence uh, of heterogeneous data. Uh, and 
we need something and how to to how to again a step back like it is done by Tim Berners Lee and I think they are uh, in in the idea they are quite uh, similar I say okay this five star principle that we also incorporate things which are dirty this should be kept so we should shift the emphasis of coexistence of heterogeneous data, heterogeneous data and Perhaps we shouldn't try to unify all the data, but we should go step by step to say, okay, we have this kind of data, one star, two star, three star, four star, five star. And this is true for all our approaches. So this is perhaps in, in an essence what I say. So we need to integrate the data on an as needed basis. And we can uh, use this kind of loosely integrated set of data sources. and. Uh, this can be achieved in an incremental pay-as-you-go fashion. Pay-as-you-go is exactly meant this one star, two star, three star, four star, five star. So we collect data even if they are originally still quite dirty, but this is our chance. Just collect the data and then we should purify them and go step by step from one star to two star to three star to four star to five star. And this is exactly what he is doing. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time. So these are the different uh, uh, layers here. There's a support platform, what you see here, consisting of the uh, data services and the stream and event services, catalogs, human tasks, entities. And then we have sensors, data source, managed entities, intelligent apps and at the end here we can do a lot so this is and here we have the actively managed entities like people equipment buildings out of all these chunks we have so it is uh, an architecture uh, of uh, a linked data space especially for a world where we have so many many sensors so many sources and so this is a scenario that at the end, we have a real world intelligent system, a combination of all these paradigms, big data, open data, knowledge graph, machine learning, a mixture of architecture, and it is supported by the development of intelligent system and applications. So at the end, we have something like in this picture, uh, we have the digitalization on the one hand side, the human computer interaction on the other side, physical, cyber, and social uh, factors. And all of this is uh, in this kind of cycle. And of course, as the question before, a lot is important for fault detection, predictive, and all the idea here, here's also what I told you before, the prescriptive analytics, because the future will not be just a predictive, but prescriptive, what should I do to heal, to, to, to improve, uh, the situation I have due to the knowledge of the big data and also of the rules I have. So this is, yes, in a nutshell, uh, what I want to say. And also we need a trusted data sharing, this is the core, if we want to go to such a world. And that's why as a Uninet and ITB, we are thinking we should use this kind of fair and care principles, that is what I think. And yes, and what is nice is we have something like an in incremental incremental intelligence system engineering. And yes, and at the end, uh, I think this is a slide uh, from, from Fajar. This is what we want to do also. I think we're very similar to Kari's approach, a sem semantic web, software engineering, and model-driven engineering come together uh, and this will be industry 4.0 or perhaps 5.0, uh, where we have this kind of contribution and problem formalization, uh, our human approach, and the evaluation in the software uh, engineering area. So both uh, the three things of problem formalization, the human computation approach, and the evaluation in the software engineering area. And all these ingredients come together 
But what I like with curry again, we should have this kind of five star concept everywhere. Uh, and I very much uh, want to uh, influence you to read this book. It is free. And for me, it was a treasure. So with this, uh, I want to close and say wh why, what is important for us. I think for all of us, the SDGs are important. The sustainable development goals we want to achieve. And that is, I think, our mission as uh, university people and also uh, as uh, citizens of our countries, because all countries in the world uh, has agreed to the SDGs. Uh, so to spread. And one very nice thing about ICT is not very much about ICT in the United Nations resolution of SDG, but one is the spread of information and communications technology and global interconnectedness has great potential. And I am very convinced about this to accelerate human progress, to bridge the digital divide and to develop knowledge societies. I think this is our mission also within ASEA Uninet. And with this, I would say, Prima Kasi, and if you have some questions, I'm glad to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Choa. Unfortunately, uh, we are really running out of time. So, but uh, thank you very much for sharing your ideas, your works uh, with your colleagues on Link Open Data, Knowledge Graph, and Semantic Web. For me, it's very eye opening and, and uh, very inspiring. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, <laughs> sorry, 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 and the second question is from Rizki. The first question is from Agung Dewandaru. Second question, this is from Rizki. Who is the, the uh, what is proper? Uh, the pioneer, pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> that works in semantic web. Uh, can yeah. we do some uh, improvement on webs or is there a community that responsible on, I think in, on, on semantic web? I think he wants to ask about who 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 pioneered the semantic web. Yeah, the, the, the pioneer is, is, is Tim Berners Lee, and there are then many many other people like like Pizza, etc. But also Mata Sabu, as I told you from from Vienna, yeah, she is also very deep in this, and there are a lot of uh, people also in the in the logic area, yeah? uh, working on this descriptive logic, etc. Yeah, so this is this is another community. So it. it 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 depends in which area uh, you want you want to work. Uh, the best is to to there is a conference called ISWC, and if you look to the program committee members there, yeah, and also for the keynote speakers, then you will find the the most important people in the area. ISWC, yeah? International Software. A semantic web conference. Yeah. What about the de facto most widely used ontology taxonomy standards in the world of semantic web? Uh, is there anything like that that you can advise, Prof? I think it, it, it's quite difficult. It, it, it is the, the normal uh, way to do it, like, like it is done. Uh, so I think there's, uh, it is the RDF is, is, is used. Yeah. So, as, as it is proposed by Tim Berners-Lee. Yeah? So I think, and then we, you can go uh, uh, down and down to, to the specific questions. Perhaps uh, if Fajar is there, he knows uh, very well about this. But I, I think real standard is, is Fajar, are you there? Fajar? Yes, Prof. Yes, yes I'm here. <laughs> Do you know standard on semantic? Uh, on, on, um, on it actually depends on which uh, depends, which yeah. domain that you want to uh, yeah. which you want to pre uh, present. For example, for provenance, there is this W three C standard for yeah. provenance ontology, yeah. and for yeah. some others like uh, taxonomy, you have SCOS standards. So it really depends on which. Um, it is always depends. Like 
in the old year, Dublin go for the books. And the, exactly. I, but I think I don't know how to say there is because it is like a, like an encyclopedia. Yeah? It is uh, so mm -hmm. many. If for animals, it is uh, again another one. Yeah? So mm -hmm. I, I think it is it is very difficult. So, yeah. so I think Agung can con contact Fajar if if he wants to ask sure. if, if he questions. Has a, or if you have a specific a specific uh, uh, like for for architecture, yeah? we we did uh, with, with, uh, for for building mod for beams yeah? building models. Yeah? So yes. we, we did some work uh, in, in Vienna. Yeah? Some some professor with us uh, is very deep in this. Yeah? So there are many yes. many different. It is it is diff or, or for pollution. It is another one. Yeah? I don't know. Yeah. So it is. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, 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 it's, uh, I, actually, it's very unfortunate that we cannot do sorry, more sorry. Uh, it's, discussions it's about this. But it's a well, it's okay. Uh, we hope that we can see you again in the future, probably, yeah. <laughs> for more okay. sessions on this. And and uh, but unfortunately, I have to stop this meeting. Uh, yeah. And thank you very much for everybody to join this 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 uh, lecture. Well, thank you, thank you very much for Professor yeah. Chua. Uh, and uh, other guest Fajar is here. <laughs> he supports Professor John to present this this uh, lecture. I really appreciate it, and we hope to see you again in other uh, sessions. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, so see you again. Thank you. Good afternoon thank and you. good morning. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye, -bye. bye. Terima kasih, Prof. Terima kasih, Prof. See you. Yes. Sayang, terima kasih ya. Yeah. Terima kasih. Sehat-sehat ya, Prof. Mudah-mudahan selalu sehat. Sehat-sehat ya, Fajar. Yes, yeah, siap, Pak. <laughs> ya, mari-mari. Mohon maaf, ini saya juga harus keluar belum sholat yeah, soalnya. Ya, gak apa-apa. Oke. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.